I'll call this meeting to order. This is the May 26, 2021 regular meeting of the Shirts Planning and Zoning Commission. Item number two on the agenda is to seat alternates. Uh, we have Commissioner Odom joining us on the dais tonight. Item number three, hearing of residents. I don't, anybody sign up? Nobody sign up? Anybody email anything? Are, are we still, is it? Okay, all right, so nothing for item three. Well, you know, things are changing so fast, it's hard to keep up. Uh, our item number four, our consent agenda, we have one item on there. Item A are the minutes from the May 12th, 2021 regular meeting. Commissioners, do we need to pull this item for discussion? If not, I'll entertain a motion to approve. A motion to approve the minutes as written. We have a motion to approve the consent agenda from Commissioner Ray, a second from Commissioner Greenwald. There's no discussion on the consent agenda. I'll call for the vote. Aye. 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 Seven ayes, none opposed. That motion passes. Item number five is a public hearing. The Planning and Zoning Commission will hold a public hearing related to zone change requests and replat. Within this agenda, the public hearing will be open to receive a report from staff, the applicant, the adjoining property owners affected by the applicant's request, and any other interested persons. Upon completion, the public hearing will be closed. The commission will discuss and consider the application and may request additional information from staff or the applicant if required. After deliberation, the commission is asked to consider and act upon the following requests and make a recommendation to the city council if necessary. So item 5A, ZC 2021-005, hold a public hearing, consider and make a recommendation on an amendment of part three, Shirts Code of Ordinances, Unified Development Code, to subsections within Articles 5, 9, and 14 to establish a new zoning district, Main Street Mixed Use New Development, MSMU-ND. Emily? Good evening, Commissioners. So as Chairman Outlaw mentioned, this is a UDC amendment being proposed by staff for subsections within 5, 9, and 14. Emily Delgado, Senior Planner. Let's see. It's on. Let me see if I can get closer. Gotta move this out of the way. I'm to like turn to the side maybe. <laughs> All right. So based on recent communications with property owners that are looking and interested in redeveloping, revitalizing properties on Main Street, <clears throat> and more specifically, um, potential developers that want to not use the existing structures but build new structures, they're, they're coming into um, some difficulties and challenges with some of our UDC requirements. So based on that, staff felt it was more applicable to create a new zoning district for Main Street mixed use, new development, um, and then have additional UDC amendments that kind of go hand in hand with that to increase the flexibility for the revitalization of those properties. So essentially, the new zone district and those UDC amendments that I'm gonna talk about here in just a minute um, will allow that greater flexibility and achieve those desired goals of redeveloping those properties on Main Street. So the first thing, the first UDC amendment is the statement of purpose and intent, which is basically that definition of what the zoning district is. So that first, um, line item is our existing Main Street mixed use intent purpose. There are no changes proposed to that. I just wanted to show kind of the comparison between the existing MSMU and the proposed MSMUND. So the way that it reads, Main Street mixed use new development district, MSMUND, intended to provide a base zoning district in the area along Main Street specifically for new development of existing properties. This district is intended to mirror the Main Street mixed use district allowing for both single family residential uses and low intensity commercial uses. Reduced setbacks, parking requirements, along with reduced landscape buffers are provided as part of this district to, due to physical restraints of the existing properties. So as you can read between the two of them, they're very, very similar. So the next uh, proposed UDC amendment goes hand in hand with that, with creating that in purpose and intent, we then need to add it to our dimensional requirements table. So that's what we have here in the red. And again, I provided the existing MSMU as that comparison. 
So the lot dimensions, area width and depth are proposed to be exactly the same as Main Street mixed use. Setbacks front and side are the same as existing, so 10 and five, and the rear we are proposing to decrease that from 20 feet to 10 feet. The biggest change I think between the Main Street mixed use and the Main Street mixed use new development is in relation to the parking. So as we all know, the Main Street mixed use right now, regardless of the size of the structure, the land use, you have to have two parking spaces, maximum. Um, excuse me, minimum. The Main Street mixed use new development, we wanted to take a, a look at that and really try to decide is two parking spaces enough if we're talking about a brand new building. So we decided that it, it works better on kind of a scale range. So zero to 1500 square foot building would require those two parking spaces still. So we still have parking on site regardless of how small the building is. Then if we get to the 1501 to 10,000, it requires 10 parking spaces but in an effort to still not just have a sea of parking, it has that caveat, unless the proposed land use would require less. So if the land use itself, based on the square footage, would only require five, then we'd only require five spaces. If it's over 10,000 square feet, it requires 20 parking spaces, and then has that same caveat of, if the land use would require less, you can do the lesser value. The maximum height and maximum impervious coverage, those are the same as well as the existing Main Street mixed use of 35 feet and 80%. And then the key, these um, identify those, if you've ever looked at the dimensional requirements table, we have keys on each different zoning district and then they identify specific items at the bottom. So I have those listed here. So the ones that would be applicable to the new zoning district, J, we still wanna require a site plan. If it's gonna be commercial, we wanna make sure that we can review the landscaping, the parking, all of that. So still requiring a site plan approval. Since the Main Street mixed use new development can go residential or commercial, keeping in the swimming pool for impervious coverage, that's what that K is. And then M and P go hand in hand. They both reference the Article 14, Section 21.14.3, which is the additional design requirements of the UDC, which don't worry, I'll go through what those are on a later side. But the addition of P, that's why it's in red, it would be a new key, and it's specifically for Shirts Parkway, it would not apply. So those requirements from 21.14.3 would not apply. The next item would be the permitted uses. These are exactly the same. It's mirrored to the Main Street mixed use, the existing zoning district. Um, no additional land use is allowed, no additional land uses that would be allowed by a specific use permit, they're exactly the same. So just that table at the bottom shows the land uses that would currently be allowed in Main Street mixed use and would potentially be allowed in the Main Street mixed use new development if the zoning district gets created. So the next UDC amendment that's being proposed is in Article 9, Section 2197, specifically um, to letter G in landscaping, <clears throat> which is in relation to the non-residential uh, and multifamily landscape buffer requirements. So right now, the code reads that if you're a commercial business going in adjacent to residential, you have to have a 20-foot wide landscape buffer adjacent to that residentially zoned property. The proposed amendment would provide an exemption, so that's this language here, due to the flexibility in residential, non-residential for the Main Street mixed use and Main Street mixed use new development zoning districts, the 20-foot landscape buffer requirement is not applicable. So since we have this vision that properties on Main Street, if they're zoned Main Street mixed use or the proposed Main Street mixed use new development can kind of flip back and forth between residential and commercial, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense to require someone to install a 20-foot landscape buffer that if they choose to go back to residential would no longer be applicable or required. So it, it's, it takes up and it decreases the usable area of the lots, which are pretty small um, in comparison you know, with, with the properties on Main Street. So we feel that it would just be more applicable to have a straight out exemption to not require that 20 foot landscape buffer between the residential and commercial in these two zoning districts. The next one is in relation to 2197H2, which is the perimeter landscaping. The proposed text would be the requirements of the subsection do not apply to property zone Main Street mixed use and Main Street mixed use new development. Properties under these zoning districts shall provide a minimum landscape buffer of five feet adjacent to a public right-of-way when off-street parking or vehicular use areas abut. 
So the requirement right now is that if your parking or vehicular use area is adjacent to the right of way, you have to have 15 feet of landscape buffer. By reducing it down to five feet, there's still have ample room to plant the desired trees, shrubs, but allowing more of the usable area of the lot to not be encumbered by landscaping, but be used for the actual development. And I should have pointed this out on the last slide and this slide, these proposed amendments are not just for the Main Street mixed use new development, but would also be applicable to the existing Main Street mixed use. Because the, the applicability really goes hand in hand with both of the zoning districts. So the next one for Article 9, Section 2198, Screening and Fencing B. This goes hand in hand with that 20 foot landscape buffer. So as we all know, if it's commercial adjacent to that residential, not only do they have to provide that 20 foot landscape buffer, but they also have to build an eight foot tall masonry wall. Kind of the same justification, if that commercial business goes in, technically they would need to build that eight foot wall. And in a month, a year, two years, if that property goes back to residential, now there's this eight foot masonry wall that really isn't necessary, it's not needed. Additionally, if the desire is truly to have properties on Main Street, kind of geared more towards commercial, it doesn't make sense to build a whole bunch of eight foot masonry walls dividing the properties, it doesn't really meet that walkability downtown-esque feel. So the exemption would just be for both Main Street mixed use and the Main Street mixed use new development that they would not have to build that masonry wall. And then the last proposed amendment, this is that Article 14, Section 21143, the additional design requirements. So this one is specifically for properties that are adjacent to a principal or secondary arterial. So when we think about Main Street, it's really the properties right next to Shirts Parkway. Shirts Parkway right now is considered a principal arterial, so these additional requirements would be um, added onto those properties. And that includes a 50-foot building setback and a 20-foot landscape buffer with a shade tree every 20 feet. So if you think about those properties that are on Main Street and Shirts Parkway, having a 50-foot building setback and a 20-foot landscape buffer, you really start decreasing the ability to redevelop and repurpose you know, those properties. So the exemption would, would be that the requirements of this section are not applicable to the property zone Main Street mixed use new development. So essentially we'd, we'd still get the landscape buffers that five foot landscape buffer, if you know, they have the parking or vehicular use adjacent to Shirts Parkway, we just haven't, wouldn't have the full 20 feet. This would allow the buildings to be closer to the right of ways. It would also allow you know, more of that usable space, create that more walkable downtown, more Main Street aesthetic feel, if you will. So with that, staff is making a recommendation of the approval of the UDC amendments uh, to subsections within 5, 9, and 14 as presented in order to create that increased flexibility. All right, thank you. And you're also the applicant, so you had your say, correct? <laughs> All right, I'll open the public comment. Section of this public hearing. Anyone in the audience wish to address the commission about this item? You're more than welcome to step forward. Nobody. One more time. Okay, we'll close public comment. Commissioners. Emily, would this be available to properties uh, not on Main Street, other other properties in the city? I think technically anybody could request it. I don't think we have a stipulation that you have to be on Main Street. Not that I'm. I don't. I don't think we do. Of. Okay. I don't I think we. Previously, if it's like the street behind, but I, I'm not. So I, I think an answer, I'm not sure that technically there's anything that in clearly definitively prohibits somebody, but the language in the name that goes in the description is intended to say this is for the Main Street area. Yeah, now if somebody came on, say, 78, kind of right there, we may look to the same sort of thing, but if somebody came in 
a block down here on Shirts Parkway, our answer would be no, that's not the intent of the district. We, we do have some smaller lots, commercial lots that I think they've been vacant forever because they're small and there's nothing to put there except a, another drive through coffee area. But yeah, and so I, I, I specifically what I'm thinking about is Shirts Parkway and Ashley yeah. Place. I, I think what we need to do on those, to be honest, is I think when we go through the the um, UDC update this year, we need to come up with a different solution for them. What we've done with the Main Street mix use, I don't think is the fix for there, but I think the thought process of, hey, what we have doesn't work, let's find something that is appropriate, yeah. I think we need to go through that exercise on Shirts Parkway. Yeah, because I think, the, you know, those two lots were not our fault. That was a bad decision on the developer, but you know they they stayed vacant forever that's I, right and i think they're putting up another coffee shop they are right there now so you, do you drink a lot of coffee yeah and there's plenty of places to get a cup yeah, but never mind no, I, I agree with you otherwise what we get is we get a we get something that takes up very little space like a coffee shop which may not be the ideal so yeah i mean i think this thing we've done on main street if the commission said hey why don't y'all look at something for a shirts parkway that is tailored to that and, and provides a better win-win, then I think that whole thought process. Yeah. And, I, and I don't know of any other lots besides that one on Ashley Place. I think there may be one on the, on the southern sec sector of shirts, but it may, it may not even be an issue. But I think we have some, don't we, kind of around commercial place, mm -hmm. some of those lots run yeah. into the same thing. Mm -hmm. Not on commercial, but some of those streets either Maybe way. In, um, Deer Haven, that's, a couple different ways, but it's like that's right, yeah. As well. So it, it might be useful in the future. To do a similar exercise okay. for those, yes, sir. Thank you. And so um, uh, along that line, Commissioner Barad, um, I think you mean Savannah Drive, right? And yeah, I'm really curious to see how that drive through is going to impact the, the traffic, particularly that right turn lane. Um, but, but getting back to what does MSMU cover, uh, I saw Ms. Wood there in the, in, in the back talking about, the, if you look at the zoning map, uh, MSMU includes both sides of Main Street and the south side of Exchange Avenue, okay? So, um, yeah, we, we call it Main Street mixed use, but the zoning map includes those properties along uh, Exchange. Anything else, commissioners? I just <clears throat> had, I think, a couple questions on the uh, square footage uh, versus the parking area or the, the parking of the vehicles. Mm -hmm. When I was coming in tonight, right in front of the Purple Pig, the parking was packed. And I don't know how big uh, that new uh, that new facility that he's building is. It is it over 1,500 square feet? Do you know? Square footage. For for Purple Pig, over 1,500? Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Do you know? Okay, so that would require at least 10 parking spaces yes. for that property. Yes. Good luck. So, so keep in mind, the, the, ideal it, or the idea behind the Main Street Mixed Use New Development is for we're tearing down the full existing structure and we're looking at kind of that blank slate piece of property. So, you know, it, they will know going in, we're this size, it requires the 10 spaces unless we do a land use that would require less. Not trying to work around that building footprint and then going. So, so will, the, will the existing <clears throat> commercial residential be grandfathered to where they wouldn't have to follow this? So. The, the new parking requirements only apply to new development. Yes. So to MSMU and D, not to MSMU. Yeah. The, this whole Main Street mixed use zoning and design requirements um, came out of the city's city staff finally realized that what we were trying to do or what people were trying to do on Main Street was reuse existing facilities. And it was nearly impossible to apply new development 
requirements to existing facilities. So we created, I say we, it was before my time, uh, so staff created this MSMU that recognized those difficulties and allow somebody to take an old um, an existing um, single family dwelling and turn it into a restaurant or a coffee shop, a nail salon, um, a lawyer's office, uh, recognizing that you can't get 50 foot building setbacks, you can't get uh, 25 parking spell. Some of these requirements that we, we can apply to somebody that's building on a new lot, um, you, you can't really, you know, I used to, and I had this discussion with staff many times during my, my tenure with the city, and I used to ask them, have you ever been to the Majestic Theater? How many parking spaces does the Majestic Theater, you know, the, 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 there's several thousand seats in the Majestic Theater. How many parking spaces does the Majestic Theater have? The answer is none, okay? And so the way you develop those kinds of uh, properties are you have community parking somewhere, and the city is working uh, on that too, where they've acquired uh, a parking agreement on the Union Pacific property. I think they're in the, if they haven't already, they're trying to acquire um, space to put in a city parking lot. Um, so one of my questions, uh, Emily, was going to be if, uh, how do we, uh, how do we count those community parking spaces when it, when it comes to, let, let's say, uh, well, we just, we were talking about the purple pig and let's say it needs 10 spaces. Well, he's only got five on his, maybe on his property. So does he get to count some of those public spaces? You see where I'm going? How, how do we how do we allocate those? Let's say the city has a hundred spaces in in city lots. How do we joint use those and spread that credit out amongst the users? Have we thought about that? So I would I would say if if the purple pig chose to rezone to Main Street mixed use new development, that they would be required to have the ten parking spaces. But if they're using the existing structure, there's nothing stopping them from requesting Main Street mixed use and requiring two parking spaces. So I think, and I, I, I apologize, I maybe should have made this more clear at the beginning. None of this, the, the creation of the Main Street mixed use new development, it does not get rid of the existing Main Street mixed use. So that's still an option for, there would still be an option for people to request that zoning district too, uh, that zone change too. Um, so I, that that's kind of what I, would envision. Okay. If they're using that existing structure and they just want to rehab that existing structure, that it might be more advantageous for them to go Main Street mixed use. But if they're going to demo the, the building and they want to build something brand new, that they would need to go with the Main Street mixed use new development. And, and that leads me to some of my concerns with, with what we're attempting to do here. Again, the whole purpose behind MSMU was, was the reuse of existing properties with the constraints that come with that property. Um, if you're talking about new development, um, you know, that's a whole different story. Now you're, you're starting from scratch, you're building something new, and I'm sorry if it's only a 10,000 square foot lot, it is what it is. And it's some of the same arguments I've been having with PDDs. You know, you're trying to shove, you know, a, a, a 50 pound sack of concrete in, into, into a two pound pail. And I'm not sure we should be bending the rules uh, so somebody can build something new. Uh, I was willing to make a, um, allowances and exemptions for somebody trying to reuse a, a facility, but I'm not sure somebody building something brand new should be entitled to those same um, those same exemptions. Now that said, you know you know my my big concern are those building setbacks. Um, they're not as big a concern here because if somebody comes to you to build a commercial structure. Even though, say, we have MSMU ND gets approved, if somebody comes in to build 
a commercial structure, he's going to have to comply with the International Building Code. And if he wants a five-foot side setback, he's going to have to meet the construction requirements in that code for a five-foot setback. So I'm not concerned so much from the commercial construction, but I'm concerned about the flip-flop back and forth. Somebody comes in, and we allow them to build a single-family home with, with the setbacks that you've, that you've provided here. And then down the road, uh, he wants to turn that into a restaurant. It no longer, you know, the, the, the as, I, as I've said before, what's down there today um, as single family homes w was, w were built as single family homes. And the problem, the issues we had uh, with the fire code and the building code, the problems we have trying to convert those to commercial uses, they don't meet the standards for commercial buildings. So we make some exceptions. We allow, you know, we, 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 we cut them a little slack. You know, we may, we maybe we change locks on the doors. We make them put in some exit signs and some, some things. And, and, and as I said yesterday, one of the saving graces is they're relatively small. You can't put a whole lot of people in them. Well, where I'm going with this is, is we use MSMUMD to allow somebody to construct a single family home and then six months a year down the street now he wants to turn it to commercial use well it doesn't meet the building code requirements for commercial use and it was built brand new you know again i, I understand we're trying to reuse a 50 60 70 year old house i get that but if this if somebody's building something brand new i don't see the i i, I just don't get allowing them to build it as a residence and then use it as a as, as a commercial okay be, 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 because it doesn't meet the codes okay come on up Brian we talk about it meeting the codes so yeah there are codes that apply when someone converts what was a residential structure an existing building to a commercial use there are codes that are written that they have to comply with. We don't let them skirt that. They comply with that. And, and so I, I guess I did, I, I mean, I think I understand what you're saying, but, but just to be clear for everybody, no, we have codes that when you come in and you say, I'm doing this, we go, we got a code for it, and this applies, and it's been adopted, and, and it's intended to deal with that situation. I, I think maybe where I, 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 I have a bit of a different view is, and, I, and I'll go back to your example of the Majestic, and so we talk about the Majestic and say, you know, the Majestic, it doesn't have any parking spaces at all, but it's so great. We all love going down there. We all love she seeing shows. It works because of this thing. And, and, and that makes sense. And again, I think a lot of times we do make allowances for these old buildings and the things they have. But the interesting thing that we hear as planners is folks lament, but the irony is if they walked in to build that today, you guys would say, no, no, no. Can't, can't do that. It, it's okay because it was there and everybody loves it and it's great, but you want to build something like that, we, we can't do it. And, and so I think this is maybe the kind of fundamental philosophical issue is, you know, as we try to redevelop Main Street, and, and interestingly enough, I think we're going to have this issue in our areas that are new now, down the road 30, 40 years, is the, the problem that people have had in other places is that if you want to take those older areas and you want to keep what's special about them, well, it's the majestic example. You, you won't let them build that thing you like that's old under today's code and your new codes, and I'll go back to Mr. Bro's comment about, hey, we have these small lots on Shirts Parkway and, and all we're getting is a coffee shop and, and frankly, if we didn't have digital cameras now, we would get a little Kodak, for those of you who remember the little Kodak places where you drop the film off and then you swing back around. Some people may be too young and don't remember this at all. That's, that would be what we'd get because those were the tiniest things. And, and so again, I think staff's perspective is, you know, there are, if we want to bring about this change, it, it does mean doing something different. And I, and I think at times it means making some compromises. Ironically, what we're trying to do here, 
understanding the issue with the PDD is we're trying to say let's codify that. Let's create something that applies for those folks that want to come in. And I will be clear, we have two properties who are looking to use this district that we have incorporated input and it's different property owners to, to try to let them build something new on frankly lots, one of them that's vacant, it's been vacant for quite a while, it had a house, but I don't think it had a house since I've been here. And then the other, you know, that we know has a structure on it that's, that's not viable as a residential home right by Sherrod's Parkway. And, and so I think from staff's perspective, we hear people talk about it's frustrating that the codes today don't let us do these things that we like. And, and, and then the other thing that we have dealt with as I think a commission and council we've talked about lately is this, this issue of to what degree are we trying to regulate out every problem and everything that we don't quite like. And I'm, I'm going to an extreme, so I hope it doesn't take offense. But, but you know, I think there are times we look at provisions on our code and they were there because somebody did this thing that was a problem, but we talk about a lot the problem being is that if I try to prevent that bad thing from ever happening, I'm gonna keep a lot of people from doing a lot of good stuff that we really want, and the question is where we find that balance. So fair enough to say, hey, I don't think we found the balance on this one yet. I think, I think we haven't gotten it, fair enough. But I think for me, it's, it's are we on the same page philosophically, which is we'd like to get a different development form on Main Street than we would get on 3009 or that we'd get on 1103, and that the conditions are different that we sort of have. Um, even you know, use the, the parking example at Pur Purple Pig, you know, when you go up to Green or you go to downtown New Braunfels or you go to downtown San Antonio, it's not like when you go up to Chili's here in Shirts, which again, you go to Chili's here in Shirts, you can get a pretty close parking spot all the time. You know, they've got the parking lot. But you go up to Green or you go up to New Braunfels downtown, you expect you're gonna park and you're gonna walk. And you expect there are gonna be streets on the car and it's crowded. And to some degree, that's a good problem to have that we talk about uh, with it. So yeah, in fact, the city has purchased a lot across the street from the Purple Pig. That's a public pot, public lot now. We're, we're working to get the signs rechanged. We've got the one down, um, the railroad lot further down and we're looking to acquire another one so the city can take on that role of we'll provide the parking. So again, fair point, I think I would draw a different conclusion which is if we want to get this thing that we want, which is not the typical sort of development we might see on 1103 but something that fits with Main Street, we need different rules to get it. Much the same way if we have a problem with overly small lots on Shirts Parkway, we probably ought to come up with a district that fits that, that gets us something that we want to accommodate those conditions. Um, and again, the idea of this is to have a set of rules that apply to everybody. But, but you're right, what it could mean is that somebody builds something, we're all standing out there going, oh, I didn't really think they'd do it like that. that. There may be some of that, and I think we would argue it's finding the appropriate balance of, yep, there's some risk that somebody could build something ugly with how do we get people to start building stuff down on Main Street. There's my spiel, sorry. No, that's... But I think uh, valid point. I appreciate it. Good, the, the great comments. And, you know, over 10,000 square feet, they've got to put in a fire sprinkler system anyway. That's so, right. You know. yeah, I mean, it, it would be a great thing to have somebody come in and build an 11, 12,000 square foot building that sort of fits with Main Street, yeah. that they sprinkler, that provide more parking, it's got a variety and mix of uses in there. That would be, has an elevator, you know, it's all, yes, sir. we get an elevator in shirts. Oh, so um, I come in here at a disadvantage because I didn't know about all the city parking that's going in. Yeah, fair enough. How, how, how do we find that out without making the commissioners, we, we, you know, so what we can probably start doing is maybe every time after we have a Main Street Committee meeting, I can do a debrief at PNZ and let you know. Yeah, no, and, and so I will say, yeah, if this helps, philosophically what the city has said when we've gone out and looked at some areas and said, man, if we could ever be like this, that would be great. Um, those smaller communities that have the Main Street, that have the square, they're, it's not cost effective for property owners with what tends to be small lots 
to be able to put parking on the lot and still build a workable building. And, and what we've seen out there with the houses in the current Main Street mixed use is when you're trying to convert a house to a business, nobody wants to see the entire front yard paved over. Nobody really wants to see the entire backyard paved over for a parking lot. We'd like to see a little bit of open space. We'd like to see a deck where we can have something to eat and this, that, and the other. And, and so thus, looking at what other places have done, looking at the similar constraints we have, the city has said, well, where we can help with that, that an individual property owner, frankly, just can't afford to do, is we can go out and we can provide public parking, and that can be used by everybody, as opposed to even if we had one private property owner do it, then it's private, it's just for their businesses. If you want to go to the place next door, you can't park there, you're, you're stuck. So fair, fair point. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm, I, I was looking at this and the only, well, there are two differences between MSMU and MSMU and D and that's the rear setback and the parking requirements. Mm -hmm. Could we not, uh, uh, because I remember uh, we, we had an applicant come in, uh, I don't, you know, uh, Ms. Bacon used to sit up here as a commissioner and she and her husband wanted to, I think they were gonna build three homes down there in MSMU and that's new development. Sure. And we, we did that under MSMU. We didn't feel the need. Um, where I'm going with this is now I've got basically MSMU zoning. I've got a, a, a little GB here and there. Uh, and now I'm going to throw a new one in there called MSMU ND. And once the development is complete, does it really need to still be called MSMU ND? So my question is, is there not a way to incorporate these changes into MSMU and just have that single zoning? Sure, so the reason we went with a separate district is the intent behind the, the current Main Street mixed use was really about converting a structure that was out there that was built as a residential home to a business. That was the fundamental issue. And really the, the core issue that, again, a little bit of history was, we had people who were zoned GB, but it had been and was currently being used as a residence. It was a non-conforming use. Their concern about trying to lease it to somebody for a, a commercial use, which GB allows, was, well, if I do that, I lose my non-conforming status. And if this guy can't make a go of it as an office, and, and moves out after six months, I can't lease it back as a residence, which I know I could do. And so that's part of the fundamental issue we started with was, hey, here's how to encourage you to lease it to a business. You can always lease it back. The other part is that if they converted to a business, the current standards, it didn't work for it. And so primarily it was the parking, but then it were the other standards as well. So one of the, issues is when we look at the Main Street Mixed Use District, the intent is for that conversion. And what we felt like we needed to do to make it clear for folks is write one that really is intended for new development, thus create a separate district, and let's tackle the things that are an issue there. Because we may allow an existing house that has something built, a driveway on the side, to not have the landscape buffer, because well, it's already there. But, but it's not as clear that if you wanted to build something new from scratch that you didn't have to comply with those other part of the regs. And that's really what the intent is. And again, I would say this, the ideal world, five, six, seven, ten years down the road, is everybody has come in along there and rezoned to Main Street Mixed Use or Main Street Mixed Use New Development um, and so we don't have the old GB there with some of the stuff we don't like. We don't have residences that, that you know, are, are in a residential district or having a challenge there. And, and again, this is where I would say it's gotta be viewed as, as sort of a living document or not set in stone. If we get to that point seven years from now, then we are probably need to have a conversation going, okay, now that we've had people build this stuff, now that we have, is it time to create a new district 
and maybe even at that point do some city initiated rezonings so we get a uniform zoning district to avoid confusion up and down the way. I mean, I think that makes sense. But at this point, what we've said is, we're not ready to start going, telling people, knocking on doors and say, hey, I'm from the city, I'm here to help, and I've got this great thing for you, we're gonna rezone your property to this district. You know, what we've done is we've let them come in, and now, frankly, most people, when they come in to develop, and we explain it to them, they go, oh yeah, let me come in for Main Street mixed use. It was when we brought up a number of months ago, hey, we need to look at allowing the restaurant and bar by right, that was part of that evolutionary process of if, if that's keeping them from using it, is it appropriate to change that? And thus then we had people walk in and say, I'm gonna rezone from GB to Main Street mixed use, which gets us closer to where we wanna be. So for me, it's a, this is a process we're moving along. What makes sense today won't make sense five years from now, won't make sense 10 years from now. And the only other concern I have, and it's it's really, I don't know that there's a solution, is again, uh, you know, we're waiving that masonry, the landscape buffer and the masonry wall requirement. And um, hopefully, um, you know, Main Street, that area expands to include some of the things on exchange. But right now you've got people living in their homes on a, on the south side of Exchange Avenue mm -hmm. that are now going to back up to something. And, and, and you know, I, I don't know that there have been any issues. I hate to keep picking on the purple pig, but since he's sitting out there, you know, um, ha have we seen any issues with those kinds of, of things on Main yeah. Street? We haven't had major ones, frankly, from Exchange. We have a, had a couple of noise complaints. We've had a couple of complaints. Hey, I'm... You know, I think what will get purple pig is I smell barbecue all the time. Yeah. You know, which, which again, we sit here and laugh, but yeah, if I live next door, I wouldn't want to constantly be smelling barbecue. I can appreciate that. Um, so, so what I would say is this. I think we should be prepared that we are going to start having those conflicts. Again, I'll go back to some of the research we've done. If you remember back in the day, 25, 30 years ago, St. Mary Street in San Antonio had conflicts with the residents and the businesses. Southtown has conflicts with the residents and businesses. Austin has areas with those conflicts. And I believe New Braunfels has some of those conflicts too. I, so, so I would say, yeah, I think we are expecting at some point, and we always kind of knew this, as we get more and more commercial mm -hmm. businesses coming in there that are not Monday through Friday, eight to five, we will have more of those issues. T to me, it's, it's I, I don't think that the wall in the buffer fixes that because of the nature of it. I think it really has to be, and this is my opinion, frankly, it's, and we've talked about this, us trying to facilitate with the property owners down there, a Main Street Business Owners Association that gets together, that meets every month, every couple of months, that frankly start policing themselves and saying, look, we've got to make sure that we're, um, you know, conscientious of the fact that we have residents and how do we need to operate to not bring about a bunch of problems for ourselves. You know, frankly, we've had issues or we have a lot of talk with, you know, the more places selling alcohol, how do we keep from having problems of, and I would say poorly run bars, you know, and we've used this example. There's the bar you go to meet your spouse or your coworkers after a great day of work making the community better and you want to sit down and have a beer or a glass of wine and then there are the bars you go to to get in a fight. And, and the former military folks probably are familiar with what those bars look like. But, you know, and, and so I think that's about what the operator is doing, how they approach it. And, and so I think that's got to be part of it, the city pushing for things like, hey, y'all need to form a property owners association, and y'all need to start talking about police and yourself. So when people are leaving trash out, y'all are jumping on them first before the city is and the residents are. So I only say that to say, I'm not gonna stand up here and say, oh, we aren't gonna have problems. I think we will, not sure the wall and the buffers to fix, I think it's some other fixes. And, and you know, I agree with, with staff's viewpoint, you know, that the, uh, given today this guy converts, so he has to put up a wall, but there's no wall here, and then down here there's, you know, it's just, I think that's unworkable. And, and so it's, 
I, I agree with you. I think it's one of those things we're just going to have to. And, and I'm not sure the adjacent neighbor wants that wall in this circumstance. You know, I mean, when you live, in, and I mean this, when you live in a newer subdivision further out and you've got a masonry wall on the thoroughfare plan, you tend to expect that. I'm not sure the folks necessarily want an eight-foot masonry wall coming in behind them all the time. So. All right, thank you. Commissioners, yeah, any other comments or discussion for staff? I, I do, yes. Where did the parking spaces numbers come from? It, 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 it seems kind of. Out of a hat, yeah. Yeah, it seems, to, what, what I have a problem with is going from 15, 1500 to 1501 and I got to make eight new parking places. Yeah. Is, is, is from 1501 to 10,000, is that scalable in any, yeah, any way? you could do that if you came in and said, hey, look, let's take the, the, the same concept. And, and you could even do this and say, staff, you all work it out, scale the thing up. And, and just have it graded up to you kind of get there, we can go back and add that and do that. I'd, I'd, I'd feel better with that. Yeah, I'm fine with that. So if the recommendation is we're fine as is, but we want you to scale it up from 1,500 um, to, to 10,000, and depending on what you get, even look at scaling up 20 over, we can do that as well. I mean, ba based on the normal size of a lot down there, you know, can you put a 10,000 square foot building on, on one of those small lots out there and still have it you know, st still be able to walk around and have 20 parking places. Yeah. I, I don't know. And, and the other thing, and so I'm fine with that. I mean, I think if you want to scale it, perfectly fine doing that. The other is you may have people who acquire a couple lots and there are a few bigger lots who come in and, and are able to go, hey, I've pulled together three or four lots and now I can pretty easily do a 10, 15,000 square foot building. And again, I think that would be a good thing to have some bigger buildings down there. So yeah, we can do that. So if the recommendation is, we're fine as is, but scale the parking based on what you've got. We'll work that out between now and council. On this, on the slide that you have up right now, um, can you give me a little more background on on the key um, under P, the UDC Article 14? Is is that the concept of that was to allow? So that's that uh, additional design requirement on principal arterial. So that's that 50 foot building setback from Schertz Parkway. And then within that 15 foot, 50 foot building setback, you also have to have a 20 foot landscape buffer. And that's really only applicable to the properties along Schertz Parkway and Main Street. So that's, that's where that 21-14-3, it's basically removing that 50 foot building setback and the 20 foot landscape buffer. Okay, because under that section, surprisingly, I didn't see this before, I would have brought it up earlier, um, under two talks about the requirements or B is the permitted use table. So by exempting that section, you also exempt the requirements for them to follow the permitted use table. So it would still, it would, it's my understanding, it would still require the, the use of the permitted use table in 21.5, but if that's a concern, I can specifically put 21.14.3 and then highlight there's two, two subsections that require the 50-foot building setback and the 20-foot landscape buffer. I'm happy to make that change as well, make it specific to 21.14.3, the 50-foot buffer Absolutely. and the, or 50-foot setback and the 20-foot landscape buffer. That's fine. That way it's clear that everything else would still apply. Absolutely. All right, commissioners, if we have no other questions or discussion, uh, we're looking for a motion to recommend for a recommendation of either approval or denial to city council. I'll, uh, I'll move to uh, make a recommendation to approve uh, ZC 2021-005 as written. Okay, Commissioner Haynes has made a motion to recommend approval uh, as written. Would you like to consider the changes proposed by Commissioners Broad and Platt? Was was that a was that a proposal to change them, or was that a a confirmed that she will change them? Well, staff is willing to, if if we ask them to, the staff is willing to make those changes. 
and, and I don't know, I, I, I'm hung up on words, okay? If we approve it as written, that means they don't have to make those changes. So I'll, I'll but, th but that's okay, now. I'll restate it. I'll restate okay. It. I, I, I move to uh, recommend approval for ZC 2021-005 with changes. We have a recommendation to approve with the recommended changes from Commissioner Haynes. So I have a second. Second. And that was from Commissioner Platt. Any further discussion? A question to city staff. Do you have enough information to incorporate? We have we have two proposed additions, the parking lot, the parking scaling. And, and the his. update to clarify 21-14-3. So you, you have that information? Yes, sir. Okay. Anyone else? Call for the vote. Aye. 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 Seven ayes, none opposed. The motion to recommend approval passes. Item six, items for individual consideration. Item A, PC 2021-017, consider and act upon a request for approval of a replant of the Enterprise Industrial Park subdivision, lot 12, establishing lot 13 and lot 14, an approximately 20 acre tract of land, located approximately 810 feet southwest of the intersection of the Union Pacific Railroad and Door Lane, City of Shirts, Kamau County, Texas. Good evening, Commission. As mentioned, this is the replat of the Enterprise Industrial Park subdivision, uh, lot 12 to establish lot 13 and 14. Megan Harrison, planner. Um, just to provide some reference, the property outlined in green here is uh, approximately 810 feet from the uh, southwest intersection of Union Pacific Road and Dower Lane. And here is the existing Enterprise Industrial Park subdivision. This is the replat exhibit. Um, the final plat for the Enterprise Industrial Park subdivision was approved on March 12, 2008. Um, since that approved final plat, there have been several replats of the Enterprise Industrial Subdivision um, just due to the continuation of what is out there right now. Um, so the um, property is going to be serviced by the city of Shirts Water and Sewer. There is going to be one point of access. Um, so this is just the first page. It is, I know it's, this is the second page of the replat, but I do have a slide that has it both combined. Um, but just wanted to point for reference. Um, let me get my mouse. This um, yellow arrow is a little off, but there is the one point of access from Lookout Road. Um, there is a variable width ingress and egress easement that extends through the Enterprise Industrial Park subdivision and is where it will end here at that um, replat location of lot 13 and 14. Um, fire had, has reviewed this replat. They have no objections um, to what is being proposed with that one point of access. So this is taking um, the replat as it was shown previously. It was done in two pages. This is taking it and combining it. Um, the replat is shown here of taking lot 12 and establishing lot 13 and 14. Lot 13 being that 8.38 acres and lot 14 being that 11.26 acres. The purpose of this replat is to establish two manufacturing uh, lots, which would be consistent with what is currently out there for the Enterprise Industrial uh, Park. Lot 13, um, just wanted to make a mention that lot 13, with it being approximately that nine acres, there is a 100 foot um, CPS and right of way um, easement that runs along here, but um, with this being on the property, it is still developable. So it still will meet the dimensional requirements if the property were to develop as a manufacturing site. Um, but just wanted to give some reference that um, if, you, if you can think of it to the um, east of the property, there are some areas that have some smaller buildings and maybe not to the grand size that is currently out there for enterprise, um, but they could do a smaller building with parking or storage in the back, but this 
lot 13 could still be developable and meet those dimensional requirements that are currently in the UDC. But just wanted to kind of um, make reference to that since I know that this has that uh, easement running across the portion of lot 13. Again, this is just um, for reference, this is a current uh, zoning map. This is the lot outlined in the yellow star right here. Um, again, this is the Enterprise Industrial Park and then um, Manufacturing Light District. So with that, staff recommends approval as the replot is consistent with the applicable requirements for this property ordinances and regulations. All right, thank you, Megan. Commissioners? I had some questions about access, um, and thank you for including that. <clears throat> but after I met with you folks yesterday, I did, I went up there and drove it, and there is already a driveway. Uh, <clears throat> it's hard to see on Google Google Maps there between those, uh, those buildings, it looks like it's dirt, but there's actually a concrete driveway. Um, and they're pretty wide streets. Um, there's actually, um, as I was coming back out here on the west end, there was a, a uh, 18 wheeler that was leaving. He didn't come my way. And as I, as I was looking to turn out onto Lookout Road, he was down here where the city limits are. So he came, he managed to get through this guy's parking lot because there's a road that runs from your arrow mm -hmm. up to the, up to that first gap. Yeah. And, um, so he found a way out. Um, 2020 hindsight, you know, I look at this map and I'm thinking, boy, it would have been great if our thoroughfare plan had another road that came in from Door Lane that, did, you know, if we had just taken the extension of that street and run it out, um, it, again, hindsight is such a wonderful thing, okay? Um, but I felt very comfortable, you know. I, I always have issues with access and things like that as coming from fire prevention. Uh, I felt very comfortable um, that if need be, uh, the f there, there, there's plenty of access there, even though it only looks like there's one road. So. another road running from Lookout up to Tejas Way, sort of parallel to Dower, is that what you're saying? Uh, no, what I was thinking of was, do uh, you have your, your route slide there where you had the arrow, the, cause that, yeah, if, where that arrow ends, if, if, if that was a city thoroughfare that went all the way out to, Delaware. yeah, and then, um, again, unfortunately the road that comes in, uh, on the, uh, down there, that one, it only goes to that first street, it doesn't go all the way up, but, um, but even then, if, if there was some way, uh, again, we talked about uh, Benny Keith, you know, was supposed to go through, and then the state threw in that thing about no more rail crossings. So, yeah, no, I was just lamenting that, you know, missing that crystal ball. That, that, that's all. Yes. Yes. So, no, I, I didn't mean to find, I certainly wasn't implying fault on staff's part. It just, you know, again, one of those things that, boy, if only, you know, so. Who else has got any questions or comments? Well, the, 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 the two front buildings on Lookout Road actually have, they each have two access points. Yes. So I, I believe with this one under, um, actually uh, this one is locked so nobody can, can go through there. I'm not certain about this entrance exit right here, um, but it's something that. Um, that one, Megan, is drivable um, up, to the, up to the blue line, that first blue line. So when you go past uh, that very first building, it's 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 a public thoroughfare. It's not part of their parking lot, and you can actually drive, and then you have to make the right turn. Um, yeah, and the other access to um, that Colfin, the the that building right there. Um, th no, back back here in the other corner. Um, that second access to that building was my doing. Um, 
but I believe they, uh, I don't know that the entrance itself is gated, but I think they did put a fence and a gate. Yes, it's a, yeah, it was an agreement with the fire department, so it does give them emergency access through there. And uh, that was to make me feel better back in the day. And I certainly appreciate that. Um, but again, you know, a, 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 a lot of hindsight here that if only we had done this or done that, it, it might have worked out a little bit better. But um, again, I was comfortable as, as an old fire truck driver, I, I was comfortable driving through the complex. So, because even if the streets blocked, you know, except for that very back left building, that back left corner is fenced. But other than that, you can, you can pretty much drive through these guys uh, loading areas with, without any without any issues at all. So, it, I, I share your sentiments that it'd be really nice to get access onto Dewar Lane. Uh, if there was any way that we could do that, it would it would be fantastic. Because what what I think about, you were thinking about the fire safety issues. I'm I'm thinking about 500 vehicles exiting out on Lookout Road at Quitten Time when at least some of those, maybe a fourth or a third of those could be exiting onto Dewar Lane. So, you know, I'm, I'm looking at it from a traffic flow standpoint. It would be awful nice to get something on Dewar Lane, but yeah. if, that's not, if that's not doable, then. No, I took a look. Uh, if, if you pull up this image on Google Maps, there's just, um, um, yeah, I, yeah, I just, I think that ship has sailed. It, uh, you know, if we had something in the thoroughfare plan 10, 20 years ago, it, it, we could have made it work. But, uh, and even if you go to Door Lane, you're going to come back, uh, unless you're going through um, Garden Ridge, you're going to come back to Lookout. But But almost always we look at something and say, if only, you know, if we had just, if we had just thought of it. So anyway, anybody else? This is a replat, so it's uh, our decision to approve or deny. Mr. Chairman, I'd like to make a motion that we approve PC 2021-017 as presented. Okay, I have a motion to approve from Commissioner Odom. Do I have a second? I'll second. And that was uh, Mr. Ray, correct? Okay. So I have a motion and a second to approve. Any further discussion, questions? Call the vote. Aye. 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 Seven ayes, none opposed. That motion to approve passes. Item number seven, a workshop and discussion. Workshop discussion and possible action in relation to UDC section 21.4.3, notice requirements, specifically in relation to public hearing notification signs. All right, good evening again. So as Mr. Outlaw stated, this is a workshop discussion, possible action uh, based on the notice requirement specifically for those public hearing notice signs. Emily Delgado, senior planner. So just some background, because we've had quite a few new commissioners join since 2017. In 2017, the planning staff was asked by PNZ to do some research and uh, potentially make a recommendation to make some modifications to our UDC in relation to how we do public hearing notices, specifically to try to get the notice out to property owners that are outside that 200 foot buffer, so they're not getting that mailer, but maybe live still 205 feet out, right? So they're still adjacent, the potential public hearing notice uh, would have impact them, and they may wanna still attend the meeting, so a way to get that out there to them. So staff made two presentations in 2017 and then ultimately brought forward a UDC amendment that was recommended for approval through PNZ and was ultimately approved by council in October. So that language is here, which essentially is 
If a public hearing notice is going to be published, so when a public hearing notice is required, so you think specific use permit, zone changes, um, a minimum of 11 days prior to the scheduled public hearing, so the first one being Planning and Zoning Commission, the applicant is required to come and pick up a public hearing notice sign from staff and place that on their property. That sign has to be on their property um, through the extent of the Planning and Zoning Commission and both city council meetings. It's the applicant's responsibility if that sign gets damaged or stolen, it's their responsibility to come and pick one up, another one up from us, replace that on their property. And that language has not changed. This is exactly what's in the UDC right now. It has not changed since that ordinance in 2017. So what all that actually means, when we created that Unified Development Code Amendment, we also established what that sign would look like. I'll do my best Dana White impersonation here. This is our current public hearing notice sign, if y'all have not seen one before. It's 18 by 24. It's a quarter inch. Uh, quarter inch corrugated plastic, white. They're currently made by our sign shop, which is very nice. Um, the last quote based on um, the corrugated plastic sheets that are used, we can get eight of our 18 by 24 signs. That sheet is $16, so they run about $2 a piece. We also provide metal H frames for the applicants which do not cost us anything at this point. Our code enforcement, when they pick up bandit signs, keeps the H frames for us, which is super nice. And we provide those out for people to use for the public hearing notice signs. Okay, so each one of them has the same information. These are pre-printed like this for us, and then we use black Sharpies to write on there the information that's relevant. So we have the case number, the existing and the proposed zoning, where our meeting is, obviously council chambers, and then when the PNZ meeting and when the city council meetings are. And then we also have um, the planning mainline number and the city of Shirts website. Okay. Kind of a breakdown of, of that. So how this all came about to this workshop discussion tonight, um, staff was presented with the question of, are our signs still appropriate? Are they too small? Are they really conveying the information that we want to be shared? Are they, are they really as useful as they could be or could they be better? So Megan and Jimmy did quite a bit of research and reached out to several of, the, or several of our target cities, surrounding cities, so we have some information from Cibolo, Georgetown, Round Rock, San Marcos, New Braunfels, and McKinney, which is what you can see here. I know it's a lot of information. Um, Shirts is on that top line, so you can kind of compare. So in terms of size of sign, you can see, you know, some of them are, are substantially bigger. Cibolo's four by four, um, but then Georgetown, Brand Rock, 24 by 36. New Braunfels is 24 by 18, the same as us. McKinney's four by four. So we're not completely out of the realm of what other cities are doing. In terms of the material color, basically have yellow or white. Seems like that's kind of the go-to everybody's using. Uh, sign installation seems that most of the surrounding cities that have these uh, signs, they do require the applicant to place that on the property. I know in 2017 when we originally started the conversation about the public hearing notice signs, that was a big conversation of do we want staff going onto private property and placing you know, one of these signs or is it more appropriate to have the applicant do that? Um, sign frame. Kind of same thing, they either use the H frame like we do, or they have wooden or uh, uh, wooden stakes that they use. And I have pictures that I'll show here in just a minute. Sign cost, as I mentioned, it costs the city about $2 per sign. We don't add that as an additional fee to the applicant. It's kind of just rolled into, they're already paying a zone change fee or a specific use permit fee. So we don't charge an additional fee. Some of the other cities, Cibolo charges a $60 fee for for um, having, having these signs. And then other ones, um, such as New Braunfels, it costs the city $12.50 to make the signs and they, they charge the applicant $15. So they're getting a little bit back and recouping their cost. Um, McKinney actually requires their applicants to go to a list of, I think it was six specified sign shops that can make these signs for them. So there's no cost to McKinney, but the applicant actually goes to one of those sign shops and gets that sign made for them. So it, it ranges a little bit, Round Rock $20 for sign. Um, and then the information provided 
is very similar to ours. What's taking place, the dates, you know, the contact information for the planning division, very similar information. So the, the real start to this was, I'm sure most of y'all have seen it, the Heritage Oaks public hearing notice sign on Charles Parkway in Wiederstein for that zone change. So if you look at this picture, this is just directly on the other side of Wiederstein. And you can see, so if you're driving down Shirts Parkway, the sign, this is what the sign would look like. Once you get closer, this is taken from this sidewalk. Now you can see, you know, a little closer. And then when you get a little closer to the sign, then you can read all of the information. So this is kind of where that conversation started of how do, are, do we need to reevaluate? So some examples from those other cities. Here's Round Rock, Cibolo, Georgetown. Um, like I said, they, they have very similar information. All three of them have gone with the yellow. Um, it appears Georgetown you know, has a standard sign made and then it looks like they print and insert or tape on the relevant information for that specific case rather than where we you know, write the information. And then San Marcos, New Braunfels, and McKinney, you can see those there. They all went with the white option. And then kind of to tag along with the public hearing notice signs, something else that was brought about at the same time was we're not really providing that information on the City of Shirts website like we should uh, or, or we could be to get the information out of there. So based off of the last three zone changes that we heard at the last meeting, those have been added to the City of Shirts website now. So on the very front page, you go to the City of Shirts or shirts.com, and at the very bottom there's a news and events, and you'll see this notice of public hearing that you can click on. And it takes you to the information on the three ordinances and gives you information about what the request is. And then the more information, you click on that and it actually opens up the aerial image, that public hearing um, notification map, all of that. And then obviously at the top, it provides when those public hearings will be at city council. So I just wanted to mention that this is a new feature that kind of goes with that public hearing notice as well that we're starting to do. So as soon as we send out a mailed notice, it'll now get added to the City of Shirts website too. So even for Planning and Zoning Commission meetings, when we mail that notice, it's another resource for our residents to be able to come and find the information. So to kind of start the discussion questions, potential action, um, these are some of the questions that I think we should maybe start with and, and see how, how the commission feels. So size assigned, do we want to stay with the current 24 by 18 or make a change to the two by two or a four by four? The color, are we, are we fine with the white or do we want to go yellow or do we want to be different and do hot pink, you know, whatever color we want to do. Information provided, do we feel that our signs need to have additional information? Uh, Commissioner Bro sent me an email about potentially adding a QR code to the signs. Would that be something that um, the commission would like to, to see uh, explored further? Are we still fine with the metal H frames or, you know, if we decide to go by a four by four sign, you know, what are the implications to that? Do we now need to start using some kind of wooden stake instead? And then sign installation, are we still fine with requiring the applicant to do that or is it something that the commission feels that staff needs to, to start taking on? So with that, I'll kind of kick it over to you, to, uh, to the commission to provide feedback. All right, thank you, Emily. Commissioners, questions, comments? I think uh, what we have is is adequate. Uh, I like the idea of the Q code, code and I would ask, um, do we put this in our shirts uh, magazine as well? Because you know they got that, I think there's one or two pages where it's got all that information, all the emergency numbers in there. So the, the public hearing notices itself or? Just because if somebody's driving down the road and they see that white sign, they're not going to pay much attention to it because it's just a piece of trash in the road. Basically. So I know the, the planning division information is in the magazine, just like the rest of the departments, I believe. Um, and then you can find all of our contact information on the city website as well. Um, as far as trying to post something in the magazine specific for the notices, that would be really difficult just because of the time frames to get everything in the magazine. It would. No, no, no. I was just thinking of like a. Just our contact. Sign. So that when people see that, they know what they're, 
Oh, okay, so maybe, maybe just like a off and, and read what's on there. Like a one time like notice to if you see this type of sign. Yeah, it's it's a this it's a public hearing, hearing notice. Okay. My, my two cents would be, um, as, a, as a golfer, not a very good golfer, I used white golf balls until I found it was easier to find the white and yellow <laughs> golf balls. And driving down the street at 35, 45 miles an hour, you see a white sign, you don't have a much chance to, uh, to see what's on it. Now, me being familiar with the sign, yeah, I know it's, it's a rezoning sign. But other people don't don't understand what that is, and and I, I would recommend a, a yellow sign, maybe the same size with a little bit larger uh, time and date for the uh, for the meeting and what it's what it's going to be rezoned as. Okay. That's all. Both both going to yellow and then not increasing the size of the sign itself, but in seeing if we can increase the text. Yeah, increasing font, make the font size a lot bigger. Okay. Yes, the, the, the problem now, uh, I agree. I see these signs, I know what they are. Uh, you can't read them from the road. If, if you want to read what's on them, you have to stop, so find somewhere to stop and walk up to them. Um, let me ask you a couple of questions, first of all. How do these signs relate to our signed ordinance? or are we exempt because we're the city? So they're considered a governmental sign, which does have an- Okay. Yeah. Um, having the information, having that link on the website is a great idea. One suggestion, that news banner down there at the bottom, if I remember right, is a moving banner. It goes from, it so Maybe you could talk to IT in addition to having it down there. Maybe you could have a link up, up under um, where we find the UDC and, you know, up there at the very, very. Um, maybe like under business, and, business and Yeah, may, maybe you could also put a link up there uh, that takes you to, just because that's static versus the, if, if somebody isn't really doesn't have the attention span to wait for this one to pop back up on the, yeah, it, 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 just an idea for you to think about. And the follow on to that is if, if we're gonna, if we, if we now have this information available on the website, date, time, what we're doing, what about a generic sign that just says uh, proposed zoning change and direct some, something that we can put in bigger font, um, and, and just, you know, basically what it would say, instead of having all the information on the sign, we have enough information on the sign that somebody can read from, you know, to, to tell them, hey, something's going on in this property. If you want to know what it is, go to the website. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so sort of, yeah, similar to yeah. Rumpel's where it just has the case number and then they, sure you have to go to the website to get the information. Right. That, that that's basically what I'm suggesting. Just it, it, you know, it's less detail on the sign, uh, and and you know, uh, again, our intent was because we were finding more people were interested in these than just the people that live within the 200 foot notification. You know, um, we saw that with Heritage Oaks, where we had I think the entire. Um, Rigid Carolina, whatever they, that, that, yeah, you, you know, they were they were interested in it, but only some of the people on the west side of that subdivision got notified. Mm -hmm. So that was the the original intent of this was to let the community as a whole make more more people aware of what's going on. Now, all of that said, go back to your very first slide. Uh, okay, maybe it's the next one. All right. Signs shall be posted on the subject property and or along public right of way in a format approved by the city manager or his or her designee. So it's nice that you came to us, but what it says right there is, if you don't like it, change it. <laughs> so, uh, but, but uh, yeah, again, it, it, it's nice that you consult us. And it, 
a, a bigger sign would be nice, uh, but once you get once you get away from those, what, what were the campaign signs? They were the half sheets are yeah the half sheets are four by four, so you get two of those out of an eight foot sheet. Mm -hmm. So if we go with yeah, so you're getting eight right now. Anyway, if you go, if you get much bigger than than the 18 by 24, you might even be able to do two. But you can't use those H frames; don't work anymore. Uh, I kind of like what Civilo does. That that looks like a durable frame, uh, and I'm sure, knowing our welding person down at Public Works, he'd be more than you know uh, could make those. You just have to make sure you get them back. Um, I, I, I still agree, I don't know that we want staff putting these signs out, okay? So I, I think what, whatever you do, I would recommend we, we, we continue to make the applicant responsible for physically posting the sign. So um, those are my thoughts. Anybody else? I got a few. Bigger is always better. I think um, part of it is driving by, what are you going to see? Convenience sake, am I going to actually stop, pull over somewhere and go look at it? Maybe, maybe not, but when you're thinking of convenience, if you have the information on there and they can actually see it, then they'll actually be able to go onto the website from there. QR code is perfect. Nowadays with technology, everybody walking out there, biking, they have the phone, a little quick click of the camera, and they've got it. They've got the QR code. So I think that's a, that's a way to use technology. Um, definitely the bigger the better. The color, white on black, or, or you know, white background with black lettering. Um, bigger font, though, than what we have. We have a lot of information on there, which is good to have. But when you're just going by there, you don't see all that. All you see is a notice of public hearing, and I don't even know what that's for. So unless I'm curious, then I might look into it. But a lot of people aren't curious. They've got their own lives they're leading out there. And they're just the hustle and bustle of the day to day. There could be a public notice for of a hearing for anything. I love the signs that have, uh, can you go to the sign pictures again? Of course. That one right there, go back one. The Georgetown one. It's a notice on rezoning. So if I notice there's a property that's going to be rezoned, piques my curiosity. Um, so I think we definitely need to have something in there. Yes, a public notice of a public hearing, but what's it about? Uh, so rezoning, I think that's really good. The Georgetown one I really like, except for the color, um, in combination with the Civil one too. So something I think, uh, I still think ours are a little small and a little wordy, but a hybrid of a couple of these nice ones here, like on this page in particular, uh, even the Round Rock, Rock one is a good looking one too. Um, a hybrid of those. Less is, bigger is better, less is better as well. The less information on there, just to grab somebody's attention and enough to get them onto the website, the city's website, to, to look at the particulars is probably where we need to go with it. Um, I like the, the little wire, what is the H wire thing? Mm -hmm. Yeah. God forbid trying to hammer these big signs into the ground around here. Good luck with that. Uh, I, I'm not for any of those larger si signs with bigger posts. The H frame is fine with me. Uh, I'm still amazed almost every day at the number of people in this town that, one, don't know the city has a website and wouldn't know how to get there if you fed it to them. And they never read the shirts magazine. They throw it away as soon as it comes in the mail. And, and I'm, I'm not. I'm not being silly. All the time I hear people that they, they don't even know shirts has a, a city magazine. So that's all fine, well, and good. But I think if we put a sign out and people, people who care are going to know what the sign is, people that don't have time in the day for any of this stuff, they're not going to care even if you put the sign in their front yard. So let's just keep it as simple as we can. The, if we're going to change that one and you, you put a, a QR code and you change the website like you did, I think that's a great idea. People can go find information easily if they want it and maybe reduce the amount of information on there and go to the new Braunfels sign. That, that one's good. I, maybe we can put a, 
are our colors are still gold and blue? Orange, that's like an orange and blue. And it's supposed to be gold and blue, but that's still our colors, Mr. Assistant City Manager. I, I think it's blue. I think it's blue and gold, but maybe a blue and gold hash mark border around that. That's well. That's too bad. Maybe a hash around the side to make this to make the side stand stand out. Yeah, and that's that's what I'm saying. Re reduce the the stuff on there, and and just kind of like New Braunfels with zone case, zone change pending. Put a QR code down there, down there. Maybe a website and and Brian's nut phone number. And <laughs> I, I think leave it at that. Make it simple. Keep it simple. Keep it easy. Keep it inexpensive. And like I said, those who care are going to go look for it. Those that don't care, they're not even going to notice the sign. And I think the red lettering catches people's attention more than other colors. So is the, is the consensus to move kind of towards the direction that New Braunfels has here shown? M less words, less details, but easier to find information on the website? Do we like having the case number on the sign or could it just be we have a one standard sign that every single person gets, it's not specific for their case, but you, you can scan the QR code or you can go directly to that website and sign it. Who knows what the case number means except. That's very true. The only, the only reason, I, well, I won't say the only reason, but I think it was beneficial to have the case number on our existing signs because there's sometimes the residents will call and that's the only thing that they picked up from the sign was I'm calling about this case number and we can immediately go, okay, you're, that is assigned to Megan or that's assigned to Jimmy and we can, we can get them to the right person to provide the best information. But simple enough, it's the property on Wiedersign and Shirts Parkway. We are all going to know which case it is. So if the case number is not necessary, we could add that QR code, we could, you know, make the text even bigger so it's even more in your face. Uh, you know, the concept of the QR code is nice, but the, the, that's something I don't even know how, how you generate. I'm sure IT can generate a, a QR code with, with no issue, but then you have the problem of trying to get that QR code onto the sign somehow. Um. So I think it, the QR code would work if we're making one sign or everybody's comfortable with that QR code is not taking you to specific information for that case, but it's taking you to kind of like they have a public notice, public hearing notice web page. So it's going to take you, that way it, staff isn't trying to update that QR code for every case and then we start getting to where we're taping stuff on signs for the specific project, that kind of stuff. Yes, uh, I mean, that's the thing with the QR code. It's more, yes, for the older generation, they don't use them. The, new, the younger people, they do. And it's, uh, I found out that it's so easy to use a QR code with your camera phone. That's all it is. You don't have to have a special app or anything. You just click it with your phone camera, and it will take you to the website. And we do have the website already up. So if it just takes you to the Notice of Public Hearing website, it'll give you all the information. I will add one thing. The more information information is key I do like the hearing dates on there it gives people an idea of is this something that's hot that I need to pay attention to now is this something I need to prepare for and plan for and it kind of gives them that ideal right off the bat if you know if the public hearing is next week or tomorrow makes a big difference in people's schedule um, so kind of give them an idea of uh, you know if they really need to get on looking into it and researching it or not if we can't fit it on there, it's not a big thing, but I do like the new Braunfels one uh, as far as the QR code, making it simple, easy, eye-catching, just leave it at that. So let's just quickly, oh, go ahead, Mr. Green. I agree, but again, uh, like somebody just said, 
it's the individual's responsibility to put the sign up, not you guys. I don't want you guys digging through, walking through uh, hash. But uh, let me ask you a question. I mean, <clears throat> what are what are your ideas? What uh, I mean, I'm not sure we're helping any up here, to be honest with you. Um, you know, um, but did did staff have? Did you have some ideas about this issue? I'll be I'll I'll be honest. Me personally, um, you know, I think our our existing signs. I personally think are a, a, a decent size because of keeping with the H frame and not requiring somebody to have to go out there, you know, with a hammer to get it in the ground, that kind of thing. So I think I think the the size is fine to me. Yellow, white, I think they both kind of stand out when you're, you know, driving by. Um, I would I would tend to agree with the commission that we have a lot of information on there. So does it get a little jumbled? Um, so I, I think really we just came to get feedback, get some directive, and then we'll, you know, maybe mock, uh, create some mock signs and have that a, at another meeting. So if, if the commission will bear with me, I just want to run through kind of the list. So size of sign, it sounds like everybody, at least from what I'm getting, is pretty comfortable with our existing 24 by 18. Yes? Heading on, Mr. Outlaw, a little bigger? Yeah. Autumn a little bigger? Yeah. But the question is how big? I think, you know. Yeah. And, and I, I, let me interrupt you for just a moment. I think Commissioner Broad is right. You know, the, the, the folks that are interested, they'll stop or they'll find a way to read the sign. And, you know, the other the other 99% of the people that drive by it. So, um, I, I, yeah, in, in terms of, of size and color, uh, uh, I, I think the goal should be to catch somebody's attention. That, that should be number one. Anyway, go ahead. <laughs> okay, so I'm thinking more consensus. Let's let's try the 18 by 24. Let's let staff do some mock-ups of what we could get on that size, maybe. And then if we need to talk about increasing, we can do that at the next one. Um, color, white, yellow. Is everybody okay with the white? But then maybe incorporating not just black text, but that bold red text to grab the attention? Uh, I think if it would not be a, a terrible expense or uh, if the sign shop has access to yellow colored material without going, you know, to a lot of expense or trouble, I, I would, I, I think it would be a good idea to, uh, to bring us one or two in yellow just, just as you mock them up. Okay, but but I don't want the city going out and spend a hundred dollars or two hundred dollars just to buy, you know, so you show us a couple of signs. So. Okay, I can work with the sign shop to see what that would do to yeah. the overall cost and, and. But but I think you're on the right track. I, I think if we uh, if we stick with the 24 by 18, I, I think that would would probably be the consensus of of what I've heard up here tonight. Um, and and maybe bring us some mock-ups of that we can compare to to what we've already got. The what what is that agreeable to the rest of the commission? Uh, now the only other question I have is who brought this up in the first place? So some members of <laughs> Mr. Bro's pointing at me. Uh, some members of council. Uh, mentioned that they felt like with the Heritage Oaks, you know, driving down Shirts Parkway, should we reevaluate it since we haven't looked at it since 2017? Is okay. it still meeting the goals and, you know, really being as beneficial as possible? So I'm going to, I'm going to look just to make sure green light sound good, do some mock ups, come back. So eventually, what, 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 what whatever we end up with, you're going to, you, you, you're going to take this, this will end up going to council, right? Well, Even though I pointed out on the, what, the second page, you <laughs> go when ahead, you, I'm sorry. When you talk about size and, you know, maybe they were, council was talking about the, the development on the Shirts Parkway. 
What, what would you do for the lift station on I-10? How big would that sign have to be? So stick, stick, with what, stick with what we have. Leave it at that. People who care will find out. People that don't care, they won't see. Because you know, the lift station sign on I-10, you'd have to have a billboard out there if you wanted people to see that and read it and take an interest in it. Otherwise, nobody, even driving the access road on 10, you're not going to see the sign for the lift station. So size is relative. Leave it at 24 by 18. And I think verbiage is, is critical because uh, public notice means nothing to most people, but zoning change will get their attention. Yeah. <clears throat> and, and that's the only thing we post for are zoning changes, correct? Not and specific use permits. Okay, but we don't we don't have to post for plats and replats and master plans and. So right? if we're having a, a public hearing, so there are some replats that uh, state law requires that we have public hearings. We post a sign, but typically you're talking zone changes and specific use permits. Okay, so commissioners, this is on this workshop was for. Um, discussion and possible action um, I, th I think what we're cons as a consensus we're, we're asking staff to do is mock up a you know mock up a, f uh, a few signs incorporating some of the ideas they've heard from us tonight and and come back to us and I don't think if that's what we want to do I don't think we have to take any formal action to do that so unless someone would like to do something differently. Well, I mean, some, someone could make a motion just to leave it the way it is and let it go with that. But, um, um, you know, we can do that if we want to, or we can just let staff work on it a little bit more and come back to us another, uh, another time. Yeah. I think they have some feedback. Let them go to work. Is that the general consensus? So okay. I'm going to caveat just that I'm going to work with the sign shop, so it may not be at the immediate yeah. next meeting, but we'll get yeah. that we'll get that worked up um, with very similar provide cost estimates and, and all. Sure. Okay. And then you can provide some feedback to council that you're working on it. All right. Okay. All right. Anybody? Anything else on this one, gentlemen? All right. Thank you. So item A, requests and announcements. Item A, request by commissioners to place items on a future planning and zoning agenda. Anybody have anything? All right. I think that was none. Uh, announcements by commissioners. Anybody want to share anything with us? Announcements by city staff. Nothing tonight? Uh oh, okay. We did get a um, new site plan. This is the Enterprise Industrial Park Lot 12, establishing Lot 13 and 14. This is that Lot 14. Um, so as you can see here, um, this is the 175,000 square foot building. Um, this is the um, access as it was illustrated with that arrow and then um, just the parking and the, the property. That's all I had. All right, thank you. And then um, we've got item nine, information available in the Planning and Zoning Commission packets, no discussion to occur. We have the current projects and city council status update and our unified development code zoning district and land use definitions. Um, so I didn't hear anything on requests for uh, further agenda, but uh, that's something if you, if you, if the commissioners would read through those and if we're okay with them, fine. Uh, otherwise, uh, maybe at the next meeting, we'll ask for something on the agenda. Okay, so it brings us to item 10. There being no further business for the commission this evening, this meeting is adjourned.